Okay. So, anybody want to say anything? Plus? Okay. Anthony, take it away. Um, I really like your play. Pia's Wondrous Adventures really grew out of the time of our, our pandemic. One of the things I wanted to, to celebrate and to honor were my mother, uh, who was a, a mother of four children, a widow at 29, and you know, a woman who worked as a farm worker and in a cannery, and you know, changed our lives in such profound and deep ways. This was my mother when she was eight years old. Wow. I like your beautiful dress. It looks like Mrs. Zimmer's dress. So <laughs> this was probably back in the late 30s. And she was doing a, uh, a parade on the border between the United States and Mexico celebrating September 16th. And so she got to carry the American flag. And so this is a picture of, of her. And I started thinking about my mom as a hero, but a girl hero. And so that was one of the inspirations for Pia, my, my character Pia. Oh, so that's how you created Pia. Mm -hmm. She's like, th that's one inspiration, yeah. But I wanted my mom to be a hero. For me, my mom, you know, is heroic because, uh, you know, there's just so many challenges for this young woman. Uh, but this memory uh, of her in this dress was, um, really special to her. She remembers it, you know, she battles with dementia now, but she remembers that picture and she remembers that memory of being, um, you know, children from the border. I just wanted to share with you episode one, which is there's seven episodes that I've written. So it's seven little short stories. And the first story is really about how Pia comes to be. And so Pia is a little girl of about 10 years old and uh, and it's it's like today, like now, with with how the pandemic's going, and uh, Pia loses her best friend, Mr. Jesse. He was an older man, and he's her godfather, her Nino, and um, and you know he 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 got sick from COVID, and so he he lost his life, and so Pia is very sad about that, and so. While that's happening, one of the amazing things happens, this magical moment happens when this little hummingbird comes flying in who can speak to her and she can understand him. And he has come to say, I need your help. And she's a little surprised by a little bird talking to her, but ultimately she is taken to Daxlandia, this world, this magical world where plants and animals talk. And so, she arrives in there uh, to, to Daxlandia, and she's changed from a little girl into a little fennec fox, this little cute fox with really cool long ears. And she doesn't know how that happened, but she meets this uh, other teen, she meets this teenage bird uh, named Mopalitsli. And so he's uh, very studious, he's got glasses, and he's always got a little book and he's always writing in his book. And together, they have to go find that wizard bird, the hummingbird wizard. And so they start on this journey uh, to find him. But the really cool thing is they have a taco food truck, a lowrider taco food truck that they get to go in. And so that's the first uh, episode uh, um, of Pia's wonderful, uh, Wondrous Adventure. The best part about Theater for Young People is that we are modeling empathy and we're kind of showing kids a way to be in the world and having them ask questions and kind of learn things that are different from reading a book. So it's storytelling with um, kind of messages about how to be in the world. I love working with young people and I've worked with young people before on plays, a theater for young audiences. Uh, where I've dropped into classrooms uh, with a story and gotten feedback from children. Uh, in this case, I wanted to continue to have that, use that process in the development of Pia because children are the best dramaturgs, the ones who will tell you whether they like it, understand it or not. And, um, and so I, I, I love that process. I wanted to uh, get, 
use that process again for Pia. And that's been exciting. Um, I'm Mexican American, so it reminded me a lot of like, my culture because we're from the state in Mexico called Guanajuato, and it reminded me a lot of the um, like the um, pyramids and everything in Mexico, like Teotihuacan and Chichen Itza and Mitla. So it reminded me a lot of like, the Aztecas and the Mesoamerican tradition. Wow, that is amazing. <laughs> All the things that she just talked about is sort of the world that we're exploring, you know. Oh, so cool. Yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're looking at, uh, uh, you know, pre-Columbian, before the conquest, that culture, and then try and infuse our story with that culture. And so you just hit it right on the nose, really observant. Thank you. Tell me, tell me the student's name, uh, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Rubino. Oh, Miranda. Miranda, Miranda, I, I have a question for Miranda, just really quickly kind of following up. H how do you know about all this wonderful Teotihuacan and all the pyramids? And how do you know about all that culture? Who, who shared that with you? She's coming back. She was <laughs> how, 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 who taught you all that? Where did you learn that? Did you learn that in school, from your family? Like, how did you, how did you acquire all that incredible information? Well, because I'm really, uh, really proud to be Mexican American. So I mean, my family has gone a lot of trips to um, to Mexico City and to Oaxaca and all that places that have all those pyramids. So I kind of already know a lot of background history on Mexico because of my parents and they taught me all of that stuff. Jose is um, a really extraordinary um, person in the Chicano um, Latino um, theater field, not only as a playwright, but as a director. You know, he ran this incredible um, Hispanic playwrights project for years at South Coast Rep and uh, really put this idea of, of other voices, specifically Latinx, Chicanx voices, you know, in the mainstream American theater and commissioned all these playwrights and everyone has gone through there, not only just writers, but also directors and um, actors, uh, etc. His time at UCSD was before me. He's like a generation above me um, and so we've had the same professor Jorge Huerta the the, the maestro um, he had him and then I came after him it, it, and now I'm back here again at UC San Diego but um, I've always admired um, uh, like everyone else is in the field uh, Jose uh, he is the most gentle soul but so um, uh, insightful and so soulful his work is so um, powerful in terms of just like the deep humanity and just like the he's just such a moral human being and those um, values of, of who he is as a human being and how he envisions the world and but through his lens the, the Chicanx lens is really kind of this wonderful um, uh, kind of foundation of who he is as an artist so I've always admired him from afar we've crossed paths more kind of tendentially over the years, but it wasn't until Murray wanted to commission him for this piece and invite me as a director. We all three really got to know each other and I got to know him um, even more. When I started in college, I was a U.S. History Chicano Studies major and decided to take a theater class, a performance class, thinking that you know, that might help me in graduate school to, you know, in applying and interviewing for either a, a you know, graduate program in, in law or, or history. And I took this performance class and completely fell in love with the magic of theater. Uh, it connected my childhood experiences with my uh, of seeing theater, but also just the creativity of drawing. And it just was perfect for me. The other element that I found um, a, a gift was taking classes with Dr. Jorge Huerta, who was a professor at the University of California, San Diego. And he was the first Chicano to get a PhD in theater. And he set a lot of us on fire. This is the 1970s, and Dr. Huerta turned us on to a few professional theater companies, Chicano theater companies, like El Teatro Campesino, the Farm Workers Theater, and uh, El Teatro de la Esperanza, the, the Theater of Hope. And both these companies, I would have the opportunity to see as a college student, and they completely blew my mind because it was the first time that I got to see my own community reflected on a stage telling stories that I could relate to. And so I just found that to be what I wanted to do for the rest of my life.
we were super lucky that Robert um, is a professor at UC San Diego and um, has the Chicanx Teatro Ensemble and that, um, that the university wanted him to do a project with the MFA design students. So um, that was just such a, such a gift because um, he immediately you know, called us and said, could, could this project be a project? <laughs> uh, the thing that we've been working on for you know, almost a year, can it be a project? Um, and we were like, yes, of course, how cool. So the idea for the experiment with the MFA students was to see if the form of this musical theater graphic novel mashup would work, um, and then exploring what that might look like um, and getting these design students to really use their imaginations and figuring out what, what that might do. One of the things for us and working with these MFA students is, you know, uh, we want to sort of blow the traditional forms of, of, of collaboration out of the water um, by, uh, and I'll give you an example. So designers will get a script and then they'll, you know, talk to the director and then they'll come up with some renderings and, you know, out of that, well, they'll evolve a, a design. Well, we didn't want to do that. We wanted to say, here's some prompts. You're not going to read the play yet and just come up with it. And we wanted to mash up even their collaborative process. I want to say the, the Rasquachi aesthetic is, is um, the foundation of Chicano theater. And so for um, you know myself and for Jose, it's, it's a foundational kind of aesthetic. So it's always present somehow or somewhere. And we actually really embraced it with Pia even more so. It's something that's like kind of off up <laughs> right it's kind of on its last leg right it's kind of like seeing like you know like a, a car held together with a gaffer's tape or like you know spray painted you know for primer or you know or maybe you have like a, a a clicker for your tv and it's falling apart but you have like scotch tape and it's all like the buttons don't even fall but it still works right it has a value but yet it's it's you're it's very it's a it's an aesthetic um for me it actually holds hands very deeply with the 20th century art movement arte povera and i'm thinking of it specifically mario Mer and um, uh, from Italy in terms of, of um, recycling and using what is already there in the room, so to speak. So it, for all, so it held hands beautifully, the, Rachi, the Rasquachi aesthetic with Pia because Pia has a lot to do, one of the major themes is you know, environmental justice and, and, and climate um, you know, um, issues and, so, and, and recycling. And so um, this idea of Rasquachismo really was like, easy an easy um, uh, fit in a sense with uh, with the pieces theme and where we're at in terms of you know of, of, of um, global justice so the Rasquachi aesthetic was really important for them and they took to it really easily like you know our very first class we had you know with Joanna um, Smith the puppeteer you know she gave us a boot camp on puppetry and the first thing she said was um, you know bring three things we're gonna make puppets bring a roll of toilet paper a blank roll empty roll of toilet paper a rubber band and like a handkerchief so it was like already finding like worn out things, you know, detritus and actually magicalizing them and giving them value, imbuing them in value and, and giving them a sense of, in this case, you know, art making. Here's little Pia. She comes in and then flips over with the world spinning behind her. Um, and then I have this three dimensional thing here, which is Got a lot of craziness. I kind of went a little overboard on it, I would say, but let's see. Here's Actually, can I, can I ask Roberto, can you pin him so that we all see him in the yes, middle? Yes, of course. Here's uh, the new little Pia and uh, Nepalitsi. <laughs> um, and they can have a conversation. Here's her not liking it, uh, judging. And then this is her thinking about the conversation. <laughs> um, uh, the taco truck is down here. And then the other experiment was to have the designers be a collective of um, artists. So deliberately not asking them to be in their lane. So not asking lighting designers to just think about lighting, not asking the costume designers to just think about costumes, but to really think creatively in an artistic 
collective of what the aesthetic could look like. Um, but I liken it with um, uh, with the, the the presence of this kind of for a brief digital time and the puppets, right? All these aesthetics mashing up, and one of them is this idea of seemingly dismissible or seemingly low tech, so to speak, rasquachi in the pure sense, uh, mixed with this really high, you know, tech of, of video and um, you know editing and graphics and TikTok and you know phone and all these things. So. Um, Yes, I'm interested in, in um, really embracing, as I say, my big joke is, uh, you know, I'm interested in, in uh, this is something I told the, the, the Death Row Ensemble in the spring, it's like, how do we become high-tech Aztecs? How do we embrace these ancient wisdoms, these ancient kind of tactile the drawings of the codex or even the Resquachi aesthetic, how it's morphed into that to contemporary Chicano culture with, you know, we know this kind of cosmic world or dimension of the, of the ancients as well, right? We know there's images of Pakal, the famous first, you know, Mayan astronaut that supposedly, you know, f you know, shot out to the cosmos. So it, there's always been this kind of um, um, mashup and this kind of relationship of intertwining another transient kind of connection of uh, trans connection of, um, of um, high, high and low. And as I said, and also, you know, indigenous with, with um, you know, Western. And so I call it the high tech, high tech Aztec aesthetic. And then, you know, I put it in this space and chose a red sky and made the terrain and stuff. Um, you, you also made it a very specific shape. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the box. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you talk about that? Um, yeah. I mean, part of it was, I was looking at pictures of pyramids, uh, and we had talked about like there being a flat top to um, mm -hmm. Aztec pyramids, and I wanted it to feel of that nature. I remember when we we spoke to the students, uh, the grad students, in our first uh, one of our early sessions, uh, that we were going to do something unconventional, and we 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 kept our promise. <laughs> but even we didn't say to the set designers in the class, "Okay, you're the set designer. You get to decide what this looks like." We, we had everybody do the same prompt, the same exercise. Um, and it turned out actually that the sound designer came up with a really cool aesthetic for the, you know, one of the pieces. And the lighting designer came up for a really cool aesthetic for a different kind of the piece. And so Marie and I were really much like, okay, we did some world building, we did some formal investigations, we kind of have a, a visual aesthetic that, was, that we're kind of circling or we see the potentialities. Um, what is it that you want to work, at, work on now for this second part? And he really wanted to go back to the story. He wanted to go back to the script and really uh, imbue it with authenticity, with um, uh, really profound and um, uh, uh, elements that were uh, really deep and essential to the storytelling uh, for today. And so that's why he, he wanted to meet with these experts and to have some influence, because for him, he, he really wanted to uh, consider, okay, what is Taxlandia, this kind of Mesoamerican, you know, uh, mythical landscape? Um, and so hence we worked with David Carrasco, the great um, um, uh, scholar of Mesoamerica uh, at uh, Harvard Divinity School, who just really blew open so much for uh, Jose and for myself and for Marie and for the play. I, I can't even imagine the play again without <laughs> him. So I was thinking about this because, you know, this Nopal's, you know, Nopal plant, you know, was made, they made so many things out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, and you also have the other thing that might be fun is I know that you have a lot of color in this in this play. And, you know, one of the things that comes out of the Nopal is these insects, you know, that make cochineal. This, this incredible red color that became so important in Aztec times. It still is. You know, these insects, they, they get attached to the, to the Nopal. And what they found is they then, out of this, uh, they make this incredible red color. Mm. It's so important, and it's still 
If you go into Mexican markets, you'll see things made with cochineal. Yes, he exploded it for us, but he also confirmed, I have to say, a lot of um, story elements and a lot of kind of um, impulses and, and gut instincts that Jose had put into the play already, just organically, without knowing some of it. Maybe in his DNA, who knows where it was coming from, but uh, some of the elements in the play that were already there, you know, David was able to say like, huh, you know that's like, you know, the new fire ceremony ritual, huh, you know Know that's like this element huh you know that's like that right and I was like no I just am like that was just kind of creating this story and he's like well let me talk to you about it and it was just this confirmation and a kind of deepening and and a kind of actually um, um, uh, amplifying these incredible moments that were there I think our process has been very organic I think the thing for us and for me was taking a number of the experiences that I've had working in the theater and in in new play development and bringing those elements together to explore Pia much more deeply and more collaboratively, not only with, with Robert and Murray, but also with the future audiences uh, that Pia uh, will reach one day, as well as bringing experts into the process, people in their fields uh, where the story touches on and to get insights and hopefully um, f tell a deeper story, a more profound story. Pia's Wondrous Adventures in Tuxlandia. Chapter 1. The Hummingbird Wizard Seeks a Hero. Today is Pia's 10th birthday. Sad tears in her eyes. Her best friend, Mr. Jesse. Lost his fight and died. A sickness spread across the land. No one could understand. Parents, family, and friends so sadly died in the end. I miss you, Mr. Jesse. Come back to me. I need you, Mr. Jesse. My things used to be. How do you keep from crying? I am the hummingbird wizard from the kingdom of Thaxlandia. I too have lost many friends. You can speak? Yes, I speak many languages, Metzgali. My name is Pia. In our world, Metzgali means she who seeks truth. Your world? We haven't much time. The moons are in alignment. We must go now. Go where? To Thaxlandia. Queen Elvidus, the sorceress of the eastern moons in Ocelotol, the jaguar lord of the night, have all but finished us. Only you can stop them. What's happening? Lord Ocelotol has found me. 
Prepare your fate, wizard bird. He mustn't find you! Um, no, you've been sleeping. Who are you? I am Nopalitsli, the hummingbird wizard's apprentice, Mitskali. Thank goodness I found you. I've been looking for you for days. It's Mr. Jesse's taco food truck. Oh no! <coughs> the hummingbird wizard saved your life from Lord Ocelot by changing you into your animal spirit. Change me back! Only the Hummingbird Wizard and his Wizard Excellence can do that. His last message to me from the Book of Instruction was to search for you in the Valley of Sorrows. Well, where is he? In prison in La Isla de las Muñecas. Then that's where I must go. No, it's impossible and much too dangerous. Queen Elvirus' spies are everywhere. What to do? What to do? Um, look there. Hey! Hey! What are you doing, Napalitli? Hiding? Why? Because I'm a failure! A good for nothing? I'll never be a Nawali like the great hummingbird wizard! Never say never! Mr. Jesse always said that if you never try, how will you ever get better? Is this Mr. Jesse a great Nawali in your world? No. He was my godfather and my best friend. <laughs> How did you do that? I don't know. Look, Nopalitsli, I need your help to find the hummingbird wizard so he can change me back. If that means going to La Isla de las Muñecas, then that's where we need to go. We? Yes. We! I'm not prepared for this, and I'm not very brave. That makes two of us. I'm Pia. We're partners now. Slide me some skin. Good enough. It's too far on foot, and my wings aren't strong enough to carry you, Pia Metzgali. We need something to get us there as fast as possible. The serpent path is long and treacherous. We got Mr. Jesse's taco food truck! That thing? Mr. Jesse's dream to turn an old food truck into an electric lowrider has happened! I'm calling it my Lolo. My ride. My Ramfla. Get in! Vamonos! On the surface, the path is where we go. Together as one, that's how we roll. Get the trouble ahead. Facing dangers, we'll lose our heads. One step at a time, we'll take it slow. Together as one, here we go. Sing it with me, loud and proud. One step, step at a time, time, we'll take it slow. Together, together as one, here we, we go. go.